from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 341, recorded live Thursday, October 11th, 2012. This episode is brought to you by Telerik, offering the best in developer tools and support. Online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklins.net, training developers to work smarter. And now offering Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft Connect for Windows developers. Details at GesturePAK.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Eric Kilmzak about porting the iOS touch-based game Contra Jour to HTML5 and JavaScript. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And today I'm talking with Eric Klimczak from Clarity Consulting. Um, how's it going, sir? How you doing, Scott? I'm well. Thanks for uh, talking to me. Um, so I had to talk to you. I had to call you guys right away because uh, a couple of days ago, you guys announced Contre Jour. Uh, it was a game that is a classic game. I've got it on my iPhone and my iPad, except uh, it was built in HTML5. So you ported this whole thing over to HTML5 and JavaScript, which pretty much blew my mind. Yeah, uh, that's what we've been doing for the last six months, and we're really proud of it. It's it, uh, We just released it uh, two days ago, maybe a day ago, and mm-hmm. uh, so far the feedback has been really positive. So this was originally created by uh, Mocus Games, is that right? And then Microsoft approached them and said, hey, I really want to have this running in HTML5. Right. It was uh, a one-man shop out in uh, the Ukraine or Russia, one of the two, and uh, you know, this this guy, Max, he single-handedly kind of came up with the game mechanics and the, and the concepts and built uh, pretty much the whole game, aside from the artwork and the soundtrack, by hand himself and uh, is fairly obsessed with the, the quality and kind of the fidelity of the game. Um, and when approached by Microsoft, he actually kind of turned us down. You know, he actually said that uh, he didn't think it could you could ever pull off that kind of quality in a, in an HTML5 uh, report of the game. So he actually turned us down the first time. Uh, then he actually went on to win um, you know, best tablet game of the year by Apple and a, a handful of other kind of game awards. And uh, we reapproached him and, and he accepted. Did you have to show him something to prove that you could do it? I mean, I could see if if someone were really um, kind of detail-oriented and just obsessed with, like, you know, buttery smooth animation, that they'd be like, yeah, come on, let's not... I don't want to go and dirty my game by putting it in HTML5. Right. Uh, so the IE10 team, IE9 team, the Internet Explorer team, uh, has been doing a series of what they call game changers. Uh, and Cut the Rope was kind of the last example, last year's kind of showpiece mm-hmm. item there. It was an interactive game that was ported from iOS as well. Uh, that kind of gave us a, a a little bit of street cred to to say that you know we think this is possible. We had also been working with a handful of other game companies, uh, kind of behind the scenes, doing proof of concepts that uh, proved that we could get that level of fidelity that they were you know seeking out at uh, uh, with JavaScript on in HTML5. And um, it took a little arm twisting, but we you know we got his buy in. He was fairly skeptical even up until the final moments of development, but uh, all said and done, everyone's very happy with the output. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know if the people that are listening are game developers, but I'm going to presume that they're not. I'm going to guess that most of the people who are listening are kind of, you know, smart developers, but are probably more likely to be doing text boxes over data than they are to be doing, you know, splines and and math and complicated algebra inside of in JavaScript. So let's kind of break this down a little bit. In, in in my mind, if I were going to go and create a game, I'd probably have a whole lot of transparent PNGs. I'd have some JavaScript game engine, and that's about as far as my design has gotten already. But <laughs> I, I suspect, though, looking at the stuff that's going on inside of Contrajour, kind of comparing it to Cut the Rope, this isn't a game that you could just fill up with transparent bitmaps and, and and try to fool the eye, can you? Right, that's a good point. Uh, what you're referring to is uh, just the tact, uh, you know, creative coding technique, creative design technique of using sprite animations in games. And a lot of what you see, especially 
uh, in most kind of casual games is the animations and kind of the characters you see on the screen are usually uh, their emotions and their movement are, are controlled with these sprites. And these sprites are more or less just a strip of images with frames in them that show characters in various stages or mm -hmm. animations. And uh, in Contra Jure, that we did have a fair amount of that. However, uh, the mo majority of the design, or I guess the illusion to your eye, was actually math um, calculating kind of complex Bezier curves and dynamic drawing on the screen. So, for instance... Uh, there's, you know, the main character's name is Petit. His tail wags uh, randomly, and it moves within the direction that the character's moving in, uh, and it will stretch based on his velocity. And th that's the kind of detail that, uh, you know, the game developer wanted in this game. And so when you play that game, it feels very, very fluid, especially with um, something like the tail, if you notice that little detail there. The, you know, the other kind of key element there that's kind of nice to highlight is um, Box2D drives the a lot of the uh, physics behind the scenes. So uh, maybe we were getting a little deep there for uh, uh, in the Box2D, but the, the kind of the drawing behind the game is largely dynamic, which is a little different compared to how most traditional uh, casual games are done with sprites, spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. Did you work on um, Cut the Rope? I didn't. Uh, some of the fine folks at Pixel Lab worked on it. Mm -hmm. And when I when I looked at that, and when I play HTML5 games, I always like to bring up the developer toolbar and kind of wander around and try to figure out what's what's going on. So let's let's actually do dig in a little bit. Um, you don't just write these things from scratch, right? I mean, there are known libraries within JavaScript and other uh, other engines that you can use. And Box 2D is a physics engine for games that. Uh, that was used is there is this a javascript engine or is this a c engine and you port it so yeah um we talk about frameworks uh the biggest one that we used for this game uh was box 2d and box 2d is a pretty common physics engine in the game world uh it will allow you to easily hook up things that are like um joints and ropes and for example we have characters in the game which we call snots which are these kind of stringy stretchy things and those are a collection of rope joints that are joined together with some specific kind of properties on, on the box 2d objects those uh, if there was a debug menu for example if you turned that on you'd see kind of a skeleton of all of the box 2d objects uh, in the background box 2d is was originally written I believe in C++ which was then ported to action script and then uh, recently made available in a JavaScript version for web developers. Uh, and then until maybe the recent round of browser updates, uh, most of the browsers had a pretty hard time uh, doing all the calculations that Box2D does behind the scenes. Um, mm -hmm. But with, uh, you know, especially Internet Explorer 10 and some of the advanced uh, modern browsers out there, um, we were able to replicate exactly kind of the, the physics look and feel that you get in an iOS game in HTML5. Mm -hmm. And Box2D is, is interesting because it, it originally uh, was done by Aaron uh, Cato, who works for Blizzard Entertainment, and was done a number of years ago, in fact. Yeah, it's, it's a fairly old um, engine. Not old in a bad way, but it's uh, pretty robust. And uh, if anything, you know, when I looked at some of the game creator's code, uh, for Contradure, he was using joints and ropes and, and different types of bodies in ways that I really haven't seen in box to, used like that in Box 2D in the past. So I think that's what adds to a pretty unique gameplay if you compare it to, say, like an Angry, Angry Birds, which is fairly uh, standard. It also has um, Box 2D running behind the scenes. Yeah, one of the things that's that's really interesting about Contra Jure that's so unusual, I think, compared to other games, is that the amount of um, of kind of organic animations and kind of you know idle animations are really high. I mean, Angry Birds blink and they do stuff, but for the most part, you know, you're throwing a physical body at a bunch of other physical bodies, and they all have properties, and it's finely tuned. But the general idea is one of of collision. But Contra Jure is just filled with these organic curves. I mean, even the splash screen. Uh, has these eyeballs moving around and these little creatures turning and moving. It, it just has a very non-rectangular, rectilinear kind of uh, 
of style that's almost kind of impossible to to get one's brain around. If you, if you asked me why this game won, you know, best tablet of the year game or whatever the award was from uh, Apple, um, it's exactly for those reasons. the The level of detail uh, and the amount of finesse that has gone into all of the subtleties of the game are unbelievable. Um, absolutely mm-hmm. mind blowing to me. Not really being a, a game designer per se, but uh, being a designer at heart and can appreciate the the, the finer subtleties of of a craftsmanship. But uh, I mean, this is true craftsmanship in this game, and everything from the rotation of the particles in the background to the movement of the eyes to the uh, way the character will move across the screen um, and the lighting effects that kind of bounce mm-hmm. off his skin. Uh, you know, if you look at the snots, for example, they all look at the character as he moves across the screen. So they're all kind of following him. They all blink at different rates. They all have, uh, you know, just so much detail. Mm-hmm. Uh, some things move so subtly, it's almost imperceivable. And yet the game creator, as we were building it, would you know, create uh, 50 bugs of all the visual discrepancies and things like, uh, you know, the one particle in the background of the hundred that are back there isn't moving correctly, you know? <laughs> so Really, that was my question, that he's actually kind of directing this and he knows his game backwards and forwards because he wrote it from scratch. And now you're creating this homage to it and he's not going to sign off on it unless it is the same game. Right. And that was a, you know, a major piece of the puzzle here when we were building this part of our process. And uh, Max was deeply involved with everything we did. Mm -hmm. Max is a unique character because uh, he wrote this entire game for iOS. He also wrote it in Flash and he also wrote it for uh, Windows Phone recently in XNA. Uh, So kind of this one man machine has legitimately ported this game to the majority of, uh, you know, frameworks here and uh, helped us along the way with JavaScript um, and, and uh, HTML. Yeah, he's definitely a beast. Uh, he, it looks like it won iPad Game of the Year in December 2011 at the iTunes Rewind. And it's also won uh, a Webby Award for Best Tablet Game. The list kind of goes on. Over the last uh, year, it's won a half dozen awards from Best Physics Game to Best Puzzle Game all over the place. So he wrote a lot of the ports himself, but he didn't write the JavaScript one. Did he Did he write some JavaScript? Did he say, I don't like the way this behaves, and then dive in and then fix some code and show it to you? Well, uh, not a, not exactly. He wrote the game in ActionScript at some point, and ActionScript and JavaScript are fairly similar. So mm-hmm. we had good kind of direction. However, just being the nature of JavaScript and running you know, in the browser and getting interpreted in real time, we had to make a lot of optimizations that were just fundamentally different. So when, you know, the game developer might say like, hey, you know, I've already written this, just copy and paste it. Uh, It wouldn't be that simple, just given the difference of how JavaScript is as a language, as Mm -hmm. not necessarily being object-oriented, created uh, huge struggles for us to kind of structure a large-scale application like this for JavaScript. So it is large scale. I mean, this is a lot of a lot of code. This isn't just like a single HTML page and then contrasure.js. There's there's some some work in here. You've got the box 2D. Yeah, there's probably about fifty thousand lines of code, and there may even be more at this point. But last time I checked, there was about fifty thousand. Mm-hmm. And what libraries did you use other than box 2D? So that's kind of the beauty of it. Um, there are a lot of game frameworks that are kind of emerging at this time. Uh, some that we explored, like Easel JS and Enchant JS, and a handful of the other ones, and um, they're good the, for most cases. But when you need to control every single aspect of the game and squeeze out every tiny bit of performance that you can. Uh, those frameworks tend to break down or don't offer the type of control that you're looking for. So uh, there were no other frameworks used other than Box2D for our our game. We built all of it from scratch. And um, a lot of the time 
was spent figuring out how to create our own kind of bitmap managers or animation schedulers or mm-hmm. touch framework or um, a handful of things. We we had a strategy for splitting up CSS animations versus canvas dynamic animations to kind of offset the load on on the drawing uh, mm-hmm. engines, things like that. We we did, did had done a lot of exploration of finding kind of the, the secret sauce of what combinations of canvas drawing and CSS animation and drop frame rating and, and uh, different strategies like that it would take to, to kind of produce the, the 60 frame per second quality that you get on the iOS uh, app. So there were no other frameworks. Um, he in, in the iOS game, there was a handful of frameworks that existed for game developers, but they're fairly minimal compared to some of the larger game frameworks that exist. Um, so it wasn't hard to create our own. Hi, this is Scott, and I've got a cool offer from the folks at lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A.com. It's an online learning company. They've got more than 77,000 video tutorials. They teach software, creative, business skills. Memberships start at only $25 a month. You get unlimited 24-7 access to all their top quality video courses. They're all taught by expert instructors. You get to learn anytime, anywhere, at your own pace. There's bite-sized tutorials. There's comprehensive courses. You can learn web design and programming and regular design, photography, business, 3D animation, lots more. Lynda.com's got a variety of courses for Microsoft developers. They've got courses on Visual Studio, Windows, Windows Phone, SQL Server. You can pick the courses you want, put them in your queue for whenever you're ready to watch. You can even learn on the go. They've got an optimized mobile site, and they've even got a free iPhone and iPad app for members. You can try lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A.com free for seven days. Just visit lynda.com slash Hansel Minutes, L-Y-N-D-A.com slash Hansel Minutes, exclusive for Hansel Minutes listeners, lynda.com, training online for free seven days. Check it out, lynda.com slash Hansel Minutes. Do you feel that that it's time for HTML5 gaming? Or, I mean, remember that it was just like 10 years ago when we were pretty impressed that we could put a table up and put some text boxes in it. You know, are we perverting this 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 kind of terminal, effectively, where the browser is really just a dumb terminal and we're just trying to shoehorn games into it? Or do you think that we've got where we need to go as far as uh, the libraries that JavaScript and the browser are exposing? It, it, it is time to make an HTML5 gaming platform? Uh, I definitely think it's ready. I don't know that the tooling and the libraries are have caught up yet, but mm-hmm. it takes games like Contrajor and other creative technologists to put push out games of this quality to convince people that, yeah, this is a totally viable platform for making highly immersive, high-fidelity games. And uh, I, I think our biggest struggle was not... I don't know that JavaScript and the current state of the browsers are targeting games necessarily. So the the means of producing a game framework uh, are are kind of it's the wild wild west right now. No one really knows the best way, and I think the way that we came up with is pretty good. Um, and there's a lot of other people that are doing similar things, but once the tools catch up, uh, and there's a better guidance for structuring large, complex games for the web, I think you'll see a lot more games like this uh, come out. And did you do most of your work in, like, sublime text? I mean, I watched some of the teardown videos, and it seemed like some people were in Notepad, and some people were in Visual Studio, and some people were in sublime text. Yeah. Did you just kind of use whatever you could find? That was uh, actually nice, because given that, being that it was JavaScript and, and web-based, um, we did have a slew of, you know, Microsoft technologies like TFS to manage our code and things like that. But we we had a team of like three or four people, and they were rolling in and off as we needed different expertise, ranging from kind of pure designer to you know performance level uh, JavaScript expert. And um, so everyone would have different hardware. And some of us designers used Macs, and some people used Windows, and some people liked the uh, type ahead features in Visual Studio 2012, and some of us were comfortable writing in Sublime. Uh, so it, it was an interesting workflow, but 
um, we worked pretty efficiently on all sorts of different platforms with all sorts of different hardware. So it came out pretty well. The uh, this I was looking here on a website about Box 2D and web workers and performance, and I realized that if I understand correctly, you were asked or approached by the Internet Explorer team to to do this work. But is the goal to make Internet Explorer look good? I mean, it's kind of a tough question to ask, but I mean, one could presume that they were taking a risk. I mean, that it wor- that it would work really great on IE. So at at no point did anyone ever say, "Hey, we need to make this make this game look awesome," i.e., and make the other browsers look bad. Uh, that was never the the theme of this, and that was never the uh, the point of it. The point was uh, just to s- create a game that we think is cool, uh, and it was happened to be sponsored by Microsoft, and it just happens to run the best on their browser. Uh, the other kind of goal there was there aren't many multi-touch enabled HTML5 games. And Mm -hmm. Microsoft's positioned really well, especially with Internet Explorer 10, to show off multi-touch in a browser, especially with some of the new Windows 8 tablets that are coming out. This seemed like a natural play for that platform. So uh, while we do handle touch events for all browsers, um, it works really well. Uh, The touch is actually hardware accelerated in Internet Explorer 10. So if you run the game on a Windows 8 tablet that's touch-enabled, it actually uh, performs really, really well compared to some of the other browsers. Okay, so that brings up some interesting questions around kind of vendor-specific things. I mean, for the most part, you're writing regular JavaScript and regular CSS, but were there a number of times where you had to drop in and say, we're going to need to use these vendor-specific prefixes here, and we're going to need to do this this custom, well, like a touch event? Is touch events something that HTML5 and JavaScript specify, or is that a Microsoft-specific extension? So, two questions there. Uh, the vendor-specific code or you know prefixes, um, we we had that was so when, you, when we talk about being honest, uh, that was the biggest pain in the ass, I guess, of this whole project was we we basically in many places had to write five times the amount of code that we would normally have to write because there was, you know, it's not that the code was all that different. It was just that there was different vendor prefixes that we had to satisfy. So dynamically transforming a DOM element on the screen, let's say, uh, I had to write the transform code three times or four times to satisfy all the different browsers. Uh, That said, because so much of it was done in the canvas, uh, the canvas is pretty standard across all the browsers. And so when you tell a rectangle go from 0 to 50 points and do it across the spline, uh, it just works. And it works really consistently across uh, most of the browsers. So that was good. Uh, That helped us kind of be consistent uh, with the browsers. The things that we split up and did in DOM and CSS, those were the things that ended up being pretty verbose to satisfy all the conditions. The other question I think you had was, touch support specifically touch is great uh you know i'm and i'm excited to see more people take advantage of, of touch on on as more tablets uh come out and more browsers enable touch in uh, on those devices but um for us uh there was we actually if you look at the developer teardown for the game we have a snippet in there that shows how we kind of infer the platform and decide uh, how we're going to handle touch events. Uh, each platform handles touch events slightly different, so there mm-hmm. was specific code for each browser. What we have up there um, I think is kind of a nice way of hooking up events if you're kind of if you're going to handle touch in your own games. Uh, it'll certainly simplify managing the various paths that the touch uh, events can go down. Uh, that said, um, there wasn't a huge advantage or disadvantage to handling raw touch points from any platform. I think they're all about about the same. Mm-hmm. No platform did it better than others. Uh, MS Gesture is something that's different. That's not what we used in the game, but we have used it uh, in other projects. That library is different than the way that other 
platforms handle gestures. Now this is different than raw touch, but the actual gesture. So the act of a two finger rotate or a three finger swipe, something like that. Um, Microsoft has some really nice hooks in their own gesture library API that I think personally, I think they, they work more intuitively than some of the other platforms. Mm -hmm. What do you about things like, um, coffee script or TypeScript? Did you use any kind of macro or expansion type things to try to get around some of the, the, the not fun aspects of JavaScript? So I do have an opinion on this. Uh, I've been, uh, so I'm, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm a creative guy and I'm about as technical as a creative guy can get, but, um, I did write a lot of the, a lot of code for this, but f mostly from a user experience standpoint. From a how does this button feel when you touch it? What are the animations doing? And when the when a menu slide open, all the animations are chained and you know coordinated so that they kind of trickle onto the page as opposed to just kind of linearly showing up and things like that. So very much from a front end perspective, uh, do I spend my time? But there are a lot of times where I have to get into JavaScript to make the things work the way I want them to work. And uh, I'm not by any means uh, a JavaScript expert. If anything, I'm more confused by it now than I was six months ago. <laughs> and uh, a lot of guys I know kind of in the open source space have been telling me to try out CoffeeScript. And I know that there's a decent following of folks that do CoffeeScript development. Um, but I've always been reluctant to add an additional layer of anything on on top of what I thought already was fairly cumbersome to write. So just recently, last week, uh, maybe a week before that, I, I looked into TypeScript after it was announced, and um, I was curious. So I, I rewrote certain portions of kind of my own stuff in in TypeScript, and what happened was when I compiled it and I looked at the code, it was like I instantaneously became a JavaScript master overnight without actually having to write any advanced JavaScript. So it was great for me because I know how to write object-oriented code. I, I, I've written a lot of C-sharp code and I've written a lot of ActionScript code, which has a strong kind of inheritance and object model. And when you're used to writing code like that, it makes sense. But when you're writing JavaScript and you're hanging things off a prototype and you're doing the object literal model and things, it, it just gets confusing. And just a simple thing like, well, how do I make a singleton? And how do I access it? Or how do I instantiate it? And, and those things throw me for a loop all the time. And it may be they're basic for, for a lot of developers, but for a creative guy like me, uh, they throw me for a loop. And so uh, writing code as I know how, kind of in the object-oriented model in TypeScript and having it compiled down to well-written JavaScript, that was awesome. Uh, and if we would have had that six months ago when we started writing Contra Jure, we probably would have wrote the whole thing in, in TypeScript. Interesting. Okay. When you were writing this, when you were writing Contra Jure, even though you're testing it on all browsers, like I'm looking at it right now on IE10 and then I've got it on another monitor, I've also got it running in Chrome and it looks great on both. Um, was there anything where you thought maybe you were screwed, like you were 60% done or 70% done and you're like, oh man, we just hit a limitation in the browser or a limitation in JavaScript, or basically you got stuck and you were afraid you're going to have to go back and tell somebody that it was over. I thought, I felt like that every single week. Um, <laughs> I, I thought, I thought the project was going to every, every single week <laughs> between kind of the, the level of detail. I, it, the game started off when, when we first were approached by Microsoft, it was, Hey, can you port a few levels of Conjurer to IE 10? And we're like, oh, that's easy. And then it slowly evolved into, man, this thing's awesome. It'd be great if it worked everywhere. Okay. Hey, what would it take to port every single aspect of the iOS game exactly as you see it in IE 10? And then we had kind of the added uh, pressure from the game designer of just hawkeyeing every single little detail in the game. And uh, that, you know, I was most worried that we weren't going to be able to pull off the level of quality that Max was looking for along the way and he and he was pushing us in every uh, path to make sure that we replicated it exactly a hundred percent and I would be willing to guess that he would even to this day say it's not perfect but it's it's very close <laughs> the original question was how many how many times did you think that you were basically stuck and you were like yep this is it we got as far as we could this is as close as it's going to get and now we're screwed and it's because of IE or it's because of JavaScript or whatever limitation well, we were always worried about performance in JavaScript just because um, it's JavaScript. And there's a lot of 
there's not a lot, but there's a handful of places in, in the iOS game that were done with pixel shaders or just kind of OpenGL-like techniques that just don't exist in CSS or JavaScript or the canvas. So we had to do our best to kind of um, recreate visually what you saw, but using very different means of producing that effect. And so that was a huge pain point for us. Not not pain point necessarily, but it was a, an area of the game that we spent a lot of time trying to figure out performant ways to pull off visually similar uh, effects. And I think at one point we had the ground, which is actually fairly complex. Uh, the morphing of the ground and the little shading around the ground to give it some depth. That is the most complex part of this whole game because it's made up of you know anywhere from 20 to 50 bodies in um, and joints in Box 2D, and they handle uh, touch and click input, and they all react differently. And then they have little particles like graph uh, grass and ground particles that fall off it as you move it. All those details they're all connected to the ground, and the ground drives you know a large part of the user experience. So. When we got the ground working, I think we got, you know, a whole 10 frames per second. And it was at that point in the game where we were like, well, this may be a deal breaker. We might not be able to go any farther here. And then somewhere along the line, I don't know who did it, but someone here had the bright idea to start breaking up the game into different canvases. So we broke up the ground in each ground into its own canvas that only got updated when you're interacting with it. And the rest of the time, it would just kind of sit there idly. Same with the particles in the background, and same with the, the middle ground and the character. So all those are different canvases. So for any given time, we have anywhere from 6 to 12 canvases on the screen. And once we figured that out, uh, we, we got massive perf uh, increases in all the browsers, but actually specifically in IE. And once we got that, it was just a matter of honing it down to get you know, get exactly what we were looking for. So that was, once we got over that hump, it was not smooth sailing, but it was a lot easier. <laughs> we were more confident at that point. Well, I would definitely encourage people to check it out and not just play it, but like spend time just kind of staring at it. Like I'm sitting here on level two right now and there's there's um, idle animations where the grass is moving and you could, and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, the grass is moving. And then suddenly it moves like hard, like a like a burst of wind shows up, and then the grass really bends over, totally random. And then um, there's like this, um, almost like burnt, you know, burnt particles. Like there's these pieces of black that are falling in the sky, and then if you push on the ground at the bottom of one of these grounds, then they kind of little particles just fall off of it, and that's happening all at the same time while there are. You know these these I don't even know how to describe. What are the little blue things that you're supposed to pick up? These the energy balls. They're not just static energy balls. They're they're moving in circles and they're pulsing and they're transparent and they're they have a halo around them. I mean, it's just uh, it's crazy. If you roll the guy over the grass, he'll actually influence each little blade of grass and it'll bend a little bit as he rolls over it. Yeah, it actually works on a mouse too. You've got te you've got touch and you've got mouse. I mean, even as a mouse game, it is really really compelling. Good point too, because we we built uh, different mechanisms to handle touch. This game was never meant for touch, and it, it we had to kind of force it to be a touch game, uh, or uh, sorry, a, a mouse game for mouse, and it was always built for touch, touch first. And so to adapt it for mouse, we had that. Uh, mod some of the code and add you know, little helpers there for the mouse. But um, what's notable, though, is at the end of the game, well, once you get into the dark levels, some of the visuals start to get real interesting. But then there's IE-specific levels. It doesn't mean that you can't um, play these on other browsers. You, you have to play them on a multi-touch uh, browser, on a multi-touch device. But the... Um, they were level sponsored by the IE team. They're new levels. They're not in the iOS game, and they are kind of newly developed for this release. And once you get to those levels, um, they're fairly difficult, but and you can only win them with with multi touch. But they're uh, visually fairly very stunning, and um, it was like a pleasure to work on them and, and really bring those to life. Oh, wow, that's great. Well, thanks so much. Uh, we're going to put links to both Clarity and Contrajour.ie in the show notes. And there's also some videos and some YouTubes where you 
kind of discuss some of these issues and, and do a little bit of a developer teardown. Yeah, and we're going to be putting up a series of kind of much more in-depth technical articles on our blog site, so keep an eye out for those. Um, maybe four or five of those over the next couple of weeks will pop up. So. Very cool. Well, thanks so much, Eric Klimzak, for sharing uh, what your team did with Contrejour. Thank you for having me. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.